Hey everybody, it's Jason from the Texas Gun Vault 2 and I'm coming to you today from my car. Yes, you guys get another car video because Wednesdays are my longest day at work and I won't be getting home until late and then I got some stuff I have to do. So I probably won't be able to make a garage talk video. So you guys are getting a car talk video today. And yesterday I talked about just a gun that I had and cutting foam to make a custom case, which by the way, I ended up destroying that foam. It's just not right. I, it has to be perfect. So I'm, I think I found something online that's that pick and pull foam with those little squares that are kind of pre-cut that might work for the case. I just have to go home and measure it, but I've been looking online all day. But anyway, that's a whole other story I'll make a video on at another time. Today I want to talk politics because yesterday I just talked about uh, guns. And of course I'm going to talk about gun politics, but the two things I want to talk about is number one, the election from yesterday. And I want to say that I know a lot of people get upset with me when I talk about how I'm no longer registered to vote. And people say I'm giving up and people have asked me not to talk about it or not to encourage people, but which by the way, I do not encourage you to vote or not to vote. I expect you to be an intelligent and self-aware individual, because hopefully if you're watching my channel, you think for yourself, that you know what is best for you, your situation, and what you want to do. I respect your decision no matter what that decision is, whether you vote, not vote, who you vote for. You know, I can have my, my personal opinions, but it's up to you, right? You guys are big boys and big girls. But I wanted to talk about the election yesterday, which, by the way, it's not even like a midterm election. It's like special elections, but it was election day. And some states had some big races for governor and um, attorney general and so forth. And once again, we see a couple of things that I have been predicting is going to happen. OK, well, first off, while it wasn't like a complete landslide for the Democrats, the Democrats still pretty much one. They did a, you know, a good job in a lot of these states. Uh, Kentucky, they won the governorship. Uh, Pennsylvania, they won. Ohio, they won. And you normally in an off season year, you know, off presidential election year, off midterm year, Republicans typically do pretty good because Republicans typically are the ones that are more motivated to vote. The bigger elections, the Democrats go out in mass because it's the big thing to do, right? I mean, come on, this election season and this cycle, we didn't see a bunch of people going out and and with the I voted stickers and all that kind of stuff, and you didn't get bombarded by the go register to vote. You didn't get you know, maybe a little bit of that, but it's not like it is in a typical election year. Okay. It's not even that big of a deal. And typically Republicans come out for those and Republicans typically are more motivated, especially right now, because, you know, you have the Biden administration, but guess what? Republicans lost, lost for the most part. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like a complete like defeat or anything. Um, you know, they, they won some races in Kentucky, you know, statewide races, except for the, for the governorship. But overall, it didn't really bode well. In Virginia, the Democrats now control both houses of the Virginia legislature. And trust me, gun control is coming to Virginia. Now, of course, they do have a Democrat, I'm sorry, not a Democrat, a Republican governor, which is going to probably veto it. And they don't have veto-proof majorities in the House of delegates there. So you're probably not going to see it necessarily get enacted, but you are going to see it get passed. But this just goes to show that I believe our nation has hit a tipping point, that the people that are truly involved and care about our rights and our freedoms were now outnumbered. It's much easier for people to go out and vote because they're just doing it for the thing, okay? Whatever the thing currently is, right? Um, I, I guess as the saying goes, it's hard to beat Santa Claus in an election, because typically that's what the Democrats are. You vote for us, we give you free medicine, free free medical care. We give you um, free uh, college education. We give you free this, free that, free that, okay? And the Republicans are like, whoa, 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 okay? Now, while a lot of them are rhinos and go along with this, they're just like Democrats going the speed limit. But for the most part, the Republicans aren't offering that. And it's hard to beat 
Santa Claus. And we're seeing this trend happening. Now, now, some of the political commentators that I follow and like are saying this is not something we should worry about. Uh, the polls predicted this and the factors and where these elections were and so forth. Not to worry. But I think it's over. I really do think it is over. Like, you're just not going to be able to overcome the stupid electorate. And I hate to use that that word, but so many people um, in our country, as Rush Limbaugh called them, are low information voters. They don't really know who they're voting for. Uh, they just know to go out and vote for a Democrat. They don't really know the issues. They can't even name who their representative is or the mayor is of their town. They can't name their senator. They probably can't even name the vice president. They just go out as a zombie horde and vote. And I hate to tell you, I think it's past the critical mass. It's past the critical mass that going out, it's it, you're not going to beat them anymore. Um, they can win by just sheer, sheer will alone and sheer numbers alone. But then there's issue number two. And I told you guys that I don't have any personal faith in our election system. And that's why I unregistered to vote. Because if you're registered to vote and you choose not to vote because either you're discouraged or don't want to or can't get to the polls or whatever the reason is that you choose. If you're registered to vote, our voting systems are not secure. Somebody can go and get your ballot. Let's say you get a mail-in ballot, you know, if we have another, you know, pandemic or whatever. Well, somebody can intercept that in the mail, take it, and vote for you, right? They're not really checking signatures. They just know, oh, a ballot came in. And even if you say, I didn't get my ballot, they'll be like, okay, well, we'll send you another one. Well, that other ballot, the first ballot's still going to be counted, right? So someone probably counteracted your vote, or uh, we have stories now about the voting machines in Pennsylvania that were literally flipping votes. So there's an investigation going on. Some, 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 some people caught it. And what perplexes me about voting and voting systems and com voting computers is that we have computer programs and computers that can calculate amazing things like, you know, uh, landing a probe of a certain mass on Mars. You know, it knows what the size of the object, the density of the object, the gravitational pull of Mars, and the speed and the, the trajectory and the slope and the angle. It can calculate all of this stuff. But yet we cannot create a computer that has two options. You push this button, it votes for this person. This button votes for this person and tabulates that. For some reason, that is like the most complicated computer system uh, possible to devise. I, I, I don't understand why that's so, ha so hard to do. It seems like a very simple process. I want to think that I could create a mechanical computer that could do it. If you want to vote for this person, you push this, this button and it records the vote. If you want to vote for this person, you push this button and it records the vote. Why do we have voting uh, systems that are so complicated that you vote here and it messes everything up over how how hard is it? It's not like you're you're you know doing you know astrophysics or anything. You don't need a supercomputer for it. But in Pennsylvania, in this town, they then extended the voting hours, which of course I think hurts the uh, integrity of the election. You know, voting is supposed to happen on a certain day at a certain time. If you can't make it, you can't make it, whatever. Right, Because usually when it comes to the middle of the night and these extended voting hours is where magically all these votes that Democrats typically find pop up. Right, All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, you know, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, oh, look at all these votes we just found, and magically they're all for one person, right? And I'm not saying it's conspiracy, you know, I don't want to piss anybody off or, you know, take anything. It's just very dis discouraging, because how hard is it to have a voting system where it's a pretty much a binary choice? Okay, most elections are binary choices. You got Democrat or Republican. Yeah, some you got third party, but still, if you have three choices, how hard is it to create a computer program and a computer to calculate that? Apparently, it's extremely difficult, and we pay millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to these companies uh, to create these voting machines that don't apparently work. We don't know the source code. We don't even know how they tabulate them, how they store it in memory, 
Um, there's no physical record or copy. Anyway, getting back to the, to the original point of this is I have no faith in our election system. That's why if I am not registered to vote, nobody can go and vote in my name. And um, I'm just telling you guys to prepare for next year. I know a lot of you guys are excited, thinking right now the polls are saying Donald Trump can, can, can win, he's going to win, blah, blah, blah. Don't think that's going to happen. Because the people that are fighting against you, which often are the people that are running the elections, right? As, as a famous political philosopher says, what matters is not... Um, you know, what is it? It's it's not who you vote for, it's who counts the votes, right? Well, um, you know, these these major cities, big cities, the people that run the elections, they're all for one party, and they're gonna find the votes that, that they need. And and in their mind, they're justified in manipulating things, changing things, having problems, because in their mind, they're preventing Hitler from taking power, right? So it doesn't matter if they cheat because the outcome is the right one. It's the just one. It's not, it's not the, it's, it's not the, um, I guess the ends justify the means. And so I'm just telling you guys to be prepared because there is going to come a day in the not so distant future that they're going to control everything. And trust me, they're going to be coming for your guns. They're going to, they're, they're, they're going to do it. We already see it in the executive branch through agencies and rulemaking. We already, you know, we already know that the legislatures are, are are going to do it. And now we see this is how I'm going to segue into the next thing: the court system. Because the next thing I want to talk about is the Seventh Circuit upholding Illinois assault weapons ban. Okay, a three judge panel did this, and I know some other YouTubers have talked about this and how absolutely absurd it is because. We all know, according to the Heller and the Bruin methodology, if a firearm is in common use, it is protected under the Second Amendment. But these judges that are anti-gun will find any way to manipulate words to their advantage. Just like for a while we had uh, dangerous and unusual. You know, the Heller decision said, you know, you can ban guns that are dangerous and unusual. And the operative word there is and, right? Not or, but and. But judges have interpreted that now in the anti-gun circuits, anti-gun districts, saying, well, an AR-15 is dangerous. Well, every gun is dangerous, right? Every gun, gun can kill you. Uh, but because it is dangerous, therefore it's dangerous and unusual, but we're just going to talk about the, the dangerous part. Therefore, the AR-15 is not under the um, protection of, of, the, of the Second Amendment. We're like, no, that's not what it says. It says and unusual, not or unusual. Well, the Seventh Circuit took another wording from those opinions of the Supreme Court where Justice Scalia in Heller said that you can ban and regulate guns like the M16 and the like. Now, the whole operative understanding of that is the like meaning fully automatic guns of that style and mechanical operating feature. So if I said M16s and the like, many of you guys would agree that an AK47 is an M16 or the like, meaning a um, a gun that would be defined by the military as an assault rifle, a select fire intermediate cartridge rifle um, capable of semi-automatic and fully automatic fire. But the Seventh Circuit said that AR-15s, which of course are just semi-automatic versions of AR-15s, are like M-16s, therefore they fall out of the protection of the Second Amendment. Now, we all know that the spirit of that ruling and a clear understanding of that ru of ru of ruling from Heller would mean that the AR-15 is protected by the Second Amendment. But of course, the Seventh Circuit and these anti-gun judges found a way around it. I told you, through through clever writing, through uh, twisting words and meanings, they're going to ban everything. And this is something where the anti-gunners, and it ticks me off every time, when they find a gun that they don't like, and they validate it not being covered under the Second Amendment. And they always do this, and they even, con uh, they even contradict themselves over time. So a good example is the Miller case back in the 1930s, really the first 
a case that challenged the National Firearms Act, Miller versus United States. And it dealt with a sawed-off shotgun that was transported across state lines. And the Supreme Court at the time said sawed-off shotguns, or short-barreled shotguns as we refer to them as, are not protected by the Second Amendment because they are not firearms that are useful in a militia because they are not found in common use in the, in the military. So their whole thing was, if a firearm is not useful for military service, it is not protected under the Second Amendment. Okay, so that means military arms are protected under the Second Amendment by the 1930, was I think it's 38 ruling. But then we have cases where, well, you know, and we talked about the militia clause in the Second Amendment and all that kind of stuff. But then they say uh, guns that are good for warfare or whatever are not protected, only guns used for sporting purposes and hunting. So now some, some judges say, well, if it's... Um, a good gun for the military, like in the Seventh Circuit ruling, well, it's not protected under, under, under the Second Amendment. So wait, hold on a second. So if a gun is good for military, it, it can be banned. But if it's not good enough for military service, it can be banned. We see this a lot when it comes to regulations about like Saturday night specials and 50 caliber, uh, you know, BMG guns, right? They want to ban small pocket pistols. I know in other countries like Australia and Canada, they have restrictions on very small pistols because they're easily concealable, right? So if a gun is too small, it, it, it can be banned. But then on the other hand, you got... 50 BMGs, oh, those guns are too big, they can be banned. Or AR-15 pistols can be banned because of their size. Like you have regulations and like, I think it's Hawaii about stuff like that, if it weighs over a certain size. So they want to ban guns that are good for the military, but also guns that aren't good for the military. They want to ban guns that are too small and too big. And then they'll have some weird metric like, well, the AR-15 is the weapon of choice of mass shooters, when in actuality it is handguns. However, let's just play in, in, into their argument. Let's just say they magically banned AR-15s and got all of them collected, right? You all had to give them up, and they magically got them all done. Well, all of a sudden, one of those guns that were exempt, let's say the Ruger Mini-14, becomes the next uh, gun involved in a mass you know, casualty event. What are they going to say? Well, the Mini-14 by Ruger is the gun of choice of mass shoots. We have to ban that. So the metric in that goalpost for, will forever move. And then they'll be like, well, 10-round magazines are used by uh, criminals. We have to ban those. People say the slippery slope uh, fallacy is a fallacy. It's not. We have history on our side to prove that if a gun is too big, it should be banned. A gun is too small, it should be banned. If it's used too much, it should be banned. If it's unusual meaning it's not used at all, it can be banned. If it's good for the military, it can be banned. If it's not good for the military, it can be banned. They can ban everything. And eventually they're going to come for your single shot shotguns because they're going to say it's too dangerous because of course being, I mean, I guess if you're going to be shot, you know, I'd rather be shot by a 22, I guess, than a 12 gauge, you know, slug, right? Well, therefore the shotgun is way too powerful, right? Um, or they're going to come for your hunting rifle because they're no longer going to call them hunting rifles. They're going to call them sniper rifles. So that's it. So I hate this. It's just one of those things that we keep having to deal with. We keep having to you know, fight. And it's dishonesty, a dishonesty and disingenuous by judges. And until the Supreme Court finally steps in and does something, which who knows, they may because they took the bump stock case. We're going to have to continue to deal with this because one, as I said, one court will say uh, they can ban it for this reason. And another court will say they have to ban the exact opposite type of gun because of the same thing. It's just like, ah. anyway, yeah, it's, it's sad. And these people are so happy to give up our rights to, to either legislate our rights away or through judicial opinions and clearly avoid what the Supreme Court has said. So anyway, today is going to be your black pill moment. My thoughts on the election yesterday, why you should prepare for the future, why it's anti-gun, and also um, say pretty much until the Supreme Court decides to take up an assault weapons ban case and knocks it all down, you're going to see courts forever justify banning any gun, any gun, even your, uh, let's just say you have a single stack Glock that takes six rounds and 
Uh, you only have yeah, small. They're going to say, "Well, it's an assault weapon now because it's it's black in color because you know black guns are designed for uh, military. Therefore, they can be they will do it." I know it seems odd and and crazy to us now, but that's the logical conclusion because of what they do. So just prepare for the future. That's all I'm saying. Just prepare for the for the future. I don't know what the solution is, but until the Supreme Court steps in and finally does something about this, you're just going to have to deal with it. I do not see a bright future for the Second Amendment or a bright future for our country. And, you know, I was uh, watching, and I'll end with this, um, I was watching a little clip uh, yesterday of Rush Limbaugh, you know, uh, may he rest in peace. He was talking about how America's brightest days are still ahead. It's not time to panic. And that was kind of his ending message that America's days are the best days are, are still ahead. Things are going to be brighter. It's not time to panic and still have faith in, in the American people. I think I've lost my uh, faith. I just don't see a bright future. But I'm curious what you guys do. If you guys see it, I'm happy. And it means a lot. Uh, we're all in, individuals. It's okay for you guys to disagree. But what do you guys think about my black pill moment today? And my thoughts on all this. So anyway, yesterday I talked about guns. And today I'm talking about gun politics. And it's a car video. So doing the best that I can. So I hope you guys are still having a wonderful day, a wonderful week. And if you made it to the end, use the word gun or saying gun politics in the comment section. So I know you had uh, made it to the end and was able to get through all this torture. So anyway, thanks for listening to my ramblings as always. And as always, thanks for watching.